Jamaican accent. I have no idea, my man. Hey, Tyler. Are we, we are, live, are we live, my friend? Yes, we are officially live. Good to see you, man. Um, good to see you too. Um, I had a little bit of a technical difficulty there. Was uh, of course, computer was messing up. Everything was was happening, but we are back at it. Um, we we're talking about Kitty Academy today. Where is it located? You said you were trying to pronounce it. I was trying to pronounce. Yeah, yeah. I, I was I always screw up these names. I don't, you know these Texas Georgia whatever names. New Braunfels is that how you say it outside of San Antonio? Sounds good to me. I'm sure someone will uh, correct us. Braunfels. You know, if we get it wrong yeah. here. Um, yeah, it's a new community just outside of San Antonio. Um, rapid development. Like I think I read that within a one mile radius of this Kitty Academy, they've. They've doubled the households in the last 10 years and they're going to grow another 25%. So it's just a, a, a suburb that's filling in very quickly. Um, interesting area. Today we're, we're looking at a Kitty Academy there. So we'll see. We'll see how it looks. Great. Well, look, let's talk about Kitty Academy a little bit. Um, so doing a little bit of research, you know, it's, it's an American franchise. Um, you know, basically of child learning centers, but they have over 300 franchised academies across 33 straight, 33 states. Um, I see them. I see them in Tennessee as well as in other markets that, that we service. So they're definitely well known. Um, they do build traditionally build pretty nice buildings. Um, I don't have any of their like financials or or any that. Did you happen to come across any of that, Tyler? Yeah, when I when I was looking at this one, because uh, we've done a few of these now where it was typically corporate guaranteed. So I think Kitty Academy is pretty much franchise only. So the guarantee is going to be, and and I don't have this information um, exactly who's who is the franchisee and and what he's backing it with. But I, I mean, I'm assuming it's a franchisee. Maybe he has a couple of Kitty Academies. I don't know what else. Um, but that's that's basically where the guarantee is going to come from on this one. So. It's a little bit different than some of these other ones we've been looking at recently, like the learning experience and these other ones that are full corporate guarantee on the, on the, on the lease. Um, you know, that, that being said, um, you know, the location here for a daycare looks fantastic. So even if, even if the Kitty Academy doesn't end up operating, you know, sufficiently in the area, I'm sure that, you know, you'd replace it with one of the many other growing, uh, daycare tenants out there, right? Winston, you freezing up there? Just did a test on my... Um... Yeah, and it's freezing up. So I know you've got multiple internets. Give the... You know, but while Tyler is doing that, I'll talk Kitty Academy a little bit. Um... You know, I, I like I was saying, I have seen them for sale uh, in various markets. Um, you know, you do see them on the trip on the single tenant net lease kind of um, circuit, if you will. What what Tyler was talking about um, in regards to franchisees is really common when you have a franchise type coming company, right? Is look, you know, they've got <clears throat> um, a franchise operator. Uh, this person may own a few uh, of those locations. And so their balance sheet isn't typically going to be nowhere near as strong as um, the, the, the franchisor itself. Now, that's not always the case. Uh, sometimes you have really strong uh, franchisee groups, you know, operators who own hundreds of stores and, you know, really just their core competency is operating um, that you know, that operation. So um, it's just important to kind of kind of know that going in. Who, who is guaranteeing the lease? Is it the, the parent company? Is it a franchisee? If so, what are their financials like? So what we would want to do in this situation, obviously, is get uh, get a good look at their their financials and potentially ask for a personal guarantee. That is something um, that is is often used uh, in a situation. Uh, in these type, types of leases. So, Tyler, are you back with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I've been hearing you fine, nice and clear. So, oh, great. Want to... well, let's get started. Uh, anything yeah. else before we get started on the 
on the location? No, let's just uh, let's have a look here at the map uh, real quick before we jump into the Excel sheet. All right, I'll uh, I'll add you. Yeah, I need to share you here. All right, we're at it. Yeah, so this is just real quick. This is New Braunfels. Um, if we pull out here a little bit, you can see that it's, uh, you know, just northeast of San Antonio. Uh, uh, it's considered part of the San Antonio MSA. This is a new, you know, totally new, new area. You can see all this empty space here being filled in with housing developments. Uh, the location of this, of this uh, daycare center is right here across the street from an elementary school, down the road from a, a middle school, um, and then just surrounded by houses. So, you know, this location is going, is, it's very unlikely that, you know, the, the use case here is going to change. It's going to be something to do with, with kids, uh, daycare, some type of educational facility. So as we were talking about earlier, right, like we're going to underwrite these cash flows um, according to the strength of the balance sheet of the franchisee or what's the personal guarantee or whatever. But, you know, we're not going to have to be so conservative on the backup case where this franchisee doesn't work because, you know, if you look around, this is a great area. Um, it's not going to be difficult, in my opinion, to, you know, replace this tenant with a different one of the same nature um, in case things don't work out. So. Uh, just kind of you know, throw that out there that, you know, we'll be looking at both the cash flows and as well as the backup case. Um, but, you know, they're, they both look pretty good in this scenario. Great. All right. Good deal. Well, I, I do. Uh, I am somewhat familiar with this market. I haven't visited this market in person, um, but it is kind of on a list for a client of ours to to kind of target this market. Uh, potentially next year for for one of their expansions so um that's good I, I do know it it's a strong market it's growing i mean that whole corridor from san antonio uh north i think north to to austin is is really booming i mean it's a i forget the name that they call it but it's it's they've even named it it's a really strong corridor so and you could see this is a this is a brand new kitty academy this photo is march 2022 so, you know, they were still under finishing up construction there and they, they opened in July. So brand new building um, before we get into the financials. Um, so there's a, a few things about this lease just off the top. Um, so this is the Kitty Academy. It's about a 10,000 square foot building on 1.4 acres. Was just built uh, last year. At least started in July. It's a 15 year initial lease. So we're under, underwriting it starting this year with 14 years left on the lease. Uh, they do have three five-year options afterwards, and the entire duration of the lease and the options are all 2% bumps every year. So that's pretty that's pretty good. That's that's usually about the best you're going to do uh, as far as rent increases on these on these types of leases. So 2% a year, it's a little bit better than what you might get sometimes, which is a 10% a bump every five years. Um, as we discussed, the guarantee is from the franchisee. Um, and... What they're currently asking on this property is a six cap. So they're doing 280,000 in net operating income. Uh, they're asking 4.675 million, which works out to this 6.0, exactly 6.0 cap. So, you know, um, not the lowest of low ends of cap rates, but also, you know, it's it's not as high as some of the ones we've been we've been seeing in this space. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, how these cash flows line up with some other stuff that's that's in the market. Yeah, and it, it looks, Tyler, it also appears that this isn't a true triple net lease, right? This is kind of a double net plus. So, um, you know, I, already starting out, I mean, er, there's always a buyer for everything, but you're all, you're already kind of looking at this so hmm, I don't know, right? Um, capital rates already pretty low. You've got a, a private franchisee, not sure on their balance sheet or how many locations that they own, <clears throat> but you also uh, have, have the a lease, lease structure or lease type that isn't quite as uh, interesting as an absolute triple net. So anyway, I don't want to ruin the yeah. party. Let's, let's keep going. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm right there with you. So, yeah, the, and by double net plus, what I'm saying there is that uh, the landlord is responsible for roof and structure. 
the tenant's responsible for everything else. So that's, you know, it's not an absolute triple net lease, as Winston said. Um, but that doesn't stop them from capping the net operating income rather than your actual uh, free cash flow. So just so, you know, that's clear. When it's not a perfect absolute net lease, um, the cap rate uh, reads a little bit differently than if it was. So uh, it could be a little bit higher. So, you know, just looking at the acquisition and operating cash for those real quick. Um, you can see here our purchase price. We're assuming 1% closing fees. Uh, you've got your base rent there. I'm assuming $10,000 a year uh, for capital reserve for the event for eventual repairs to the roof and structure um, with a 2% increase both in the rent and 2% increase on the on the reserve yearly. When we get to disposition, so we always have to assume at some point we're going to sell this thing, whether we whether we actually hold it into to infinity or not. At, at some point, you know, when we underwrite them, we have to assume we're going to we're going to sell it. I'm choosing year 14, which is the end of the initial term. Um, you know, the lease could end before they could renew. But if we choose year 14 and then discount those, then 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 we're able to separate the way we discount those uh, income cash flows for the duration of the initial lease. And then also the potential secondary scenario where we have to retenant. So I've got two scenarios outlined here. Scenario one, scenario two. Scenario one is the tenant will renew at the end of the 14 year lease and will sell the property with an exit cap rate. And scenario two is um, the tenant will leave at the end of their lease and then we have to re ha spend some money to retenant. So those two scenarios are here right now. So at year 14, the net operating income will have grown 2% a year. So it'll be about $370,000 a year. Um, I'm using an exit cap rate of 6.7. That's five basis points a year, uh, basically of um, deterioration. So the building's going to be 14 years old instead of brand new. Tenant's going to be on five-year options rather than a 15-year new lease. So instead of a six cap, which we would assume we're going in at, or we would assume we're going to be going out at a 6.7 cap. And then in scenario two, um, I'm assuming about the same market rent uh, for the building would, would probably be a similar tenant. However, I'm assuming $100 a square foot in adaptive reuse. So you can see the exit, the, the net proceeds from exit for both of those scenarios. One's 5.2 million, the other is uh, 4.8 million. So it's not actually that much of a difference in the if, if these numbers uh, prove to be accurate. The way we're underwriting it, it's not that much of a difference between if the tenant renews or if we had to do an adaptive reuse. So something I'm curious about is we talk about when a, if and when a tenant renews. So oftentimes, uh, I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball, not not much one is, you know, a lot of times people say, hey, look, you got to sell the lease with at least 10 years remaining to actually get good value for for the cap, right? If you want if you want a good cap rate, you got to sell with over 10 years remaining. So. With that said, what would it look like, Tyler, if we sold at the same cap rate we purchased at in year two? So we look in like year, it looks like we're year ten. Five, yeah, currently we're okay. looking at this, and we're saying we're going to get five point two million, um, holding it for I believe fourteen years, and then having them renew and then sell it. I think at a six seven cap. Yeah. So what would our what would our net proceeds be if we sold in year 10 at a six cap? Yeah, if we sold in year like if we had 10 years remaining and we okay. sold at a six cap. So it'd be year four then. Yep. It would be coming out at 4.8 million. Yep. So we would have a better cap rate. We're selling at a better cap rate. But the increased um, the the increased rent rate, which is what two two percent a year, I believe, um, it's still you know over that four year the five year period um, still doesn't quite make up the the difference. Now, with that said, um, what about in scenario two that we're discussing here? So, did did what you do change anything in scenario two? Yeah, well, in four years. You're probably not your market rent's not going to be as high right because you don't have 10 years of, of two percent increases so that's going to drop down your adaptive reuse um what was it 4.8 before so down 3.7 so you're gonna you're gonna drop off quite a bit in that case 
because you didn't have enough time to raise the value of the property. But you're also probably not going to be spending $100 a square foot in renovations if you're a four year old building, yeah. right? So yeah. Yeah. that's also not probably realistic. So if you if you drop that down, then yeah, it's it's going to be dropped a bit, but you know, it still shouldn't be that much of a difference. I don't even know if you spend 50 for a, on a, I don't know, on a 10,000 square foot building, to be honest. Um, yeah. So, but, so the reason why I wanted, uh, the reason why I wanted to ask that Tyler was just really um, to kind of give an, give a couple of situations. So in scenario one, we went from 5.24 million um, to 4.8 million. Well, there may be a situation where you need to sell it right within the first 14 years. And so if you sell it with 10 years remaining at the same cap rate of a 6%, you could, you know, you're, you're buying at a 4.675, but you're also paying down the note, right? Over the, over those four or five years that you're, you're owning it. So we, if, and when you do sell it, um, you're still going to be able to have a decent, um, cash return you, you've got good equity over those four years that you've paid down right so mm -hmm. i just want to kind of yeah. highlight that as as an example of it does change the numbers however um there is a situation where you would want to do that and there's a lot of people that do that they'll buy 15 year leases uh hold it for four years sell it with 10 plus years remaining um and then and just roll that into the to, to another property 1031 yeah. into another property. All right, I've hijacked you long enough. Keep keep going. And all and and no, no, let's stay here. And before we we leave this, so let me push back on that. So um the 10 year, if you're looking at a 10 year, so you're saying, you know, if, if there's less than 10 years, you're gonna devalue devalue the lease. I'll, I would push back and say it 100 percent depends on the real estate. If you're in a crappy location with an amazing tenant, I will give you that every day of the week because the value is the lease. But if you're in an amazing location with a crappy tenant, you might even be happy to have one year on that lease. It might be worth more one year in the lease than 10 years in the lease. Right? Absolutely. So, yeah, so absolutely. The, the lease, the remaining lease term is one is 100 percent relative in value to the tenant versus the value of the real estate. And I would argue that on this one, the real estate is worth, if not at least as much as the tenant, if not more, because great real estate and an OK tenant. But that's. That's a bit subjective, but you know, I, I I would I don't think this is a situation where you have um, Starbucks in a terrible location, which would which would be a, a, a lease worth nothing with one year, but a lot with fifteen. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I think it's well said. All right. Let's let me just put this up to where eleven seventy. you know let's look at you know, what does this look like with leverage right so if you were to put 50 percent on this thing um assuming a 6.5 five percent loan which is pretty much what we're, what we're looking at today um you're out of pocket 2.3 million right out of the gun you're going to be cash flow positive for for the duration of the of the lease um growing two percent a year so you're going to get more and more cash flow positive as this thing goes on and then you're exiting at you know 3.8 million uh net, net proceeds at the end right so what is that in terms of irr what is that in terms of multiplier on your on your invested capital right that's a 6.85 unlevered irr and about a 2x multiplier on your capital in 14 years and then you know with the loan you're slightly better than that so you're you have um slightly positive leverage in this case so you don't have to worry about the bank loan um, hurting your IRR, but it's also not not helping that much. So in a scenario like this, you know, my suggestion would be use the least amount of leverage um, because the added risk of the leverage is not really giving you that additional you know return for your risk. So in this scenario, you'd really just want to use the the minimum leverage that you need based on how much cash you you have available for the deal. Right? In my opinion, you know, to get you to two point two a two point two uh, uh, multiplier on your capital. Yeah, I totally agree. I think you got to be really careful on these exchange rates and the cap rates, right? I mean, I don't see many situations unless you really have to pay, place the money why you're going to purchase something at a lower cap rate than the cost of capital. Right? Unless you really, you know, you really need to place that, that money. 
And so let's just, I mean, we talked about, we talked about this, right? Let's put this in perspective, um, the cap rate of this. So these are daycares, uh, education comps that have gone in the last six months. Um, this one, it doesn't look bad versus, versus the average. It's a little bit above the line here. So you can see 14 year, this is a remaining term versus closing cap rate of, of the sales comps. So you can see that it's, it's above the line, which means that it's, you know, it's, it's relatively underpriced compared to the market. Um, but again, this is not, I would argue that this, this lease is not, um, the average market lease. I would, I would say it's a bit worse. So I would actually, I would expect it to be above the line. And those are for the reasons that we've discussed earlier, right? It's a franchisee guarantee. Um, it's not a triple net lease, a, a pure triple net lease. You know, there's a couple of things going on that, you know, maybe make this not as good as, you know, some of these other corporate guaranteed, um, triple net leases that are out there. And, you know, I think two weeks ago, we looked at, uh, we looked at a deal. What was it? What was the name of the company we underwrote two weeks ago? Um, learning, Montessori, learning Montessori. Experience. we did Montessori a week ago and we did learning experience two weeks ago. Um, yeah, the Montessori yeah, it was a learning experience in uh, spring, spring Hill. Yeah. So the learning experience in spring Hill, which was also a brand new 15 year lease. Um, and Spring Hill, you could argue, is an even better market than New Braunfels. Uh, that was a 6.4 cap. So for me, and a corporate guarantee. So for me, um, just comparing those two, I would, if I had to choose, I would go with the, the former rather than what we're looking at today in a heartbeat. So I would start underwriting this at a minimum of a 6.4 cap and probably higher. Um, you know, I, I don't think this this is worth a six cap when you have a direct comparison available in the market. Um, like we just underwrote yeah. two weeks ago. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I was thinking the same thing as as we were looking at this chart here. Um, you know, you've got you got Spring Hill, which is a great market, and look, the, the population um, in the, in this community that we're underwriting today may be a little higher. Um, however, they're both very you know very comparable markets, tax free states. Excuse me, income tax free state. Um, so. It's hard to it's hard to purchase. You got to be very very favorable towards Texas to to want to purchase this one over, uh, I believe, the learning experience that we that we underwrote. So I agree. Personally, I'd like to see this up closer to the seven cap range. Yeah, I mean that's a good point, right? So if we could do this. We can play with these all day. We can look at bonds and and we can mess with what kind of discount rate we want on the cash flow. You said seven. I well, before we got in here, I was messing around with this. I put it at a seven point two seven. Um, that would get you discounting the income cash flows at a, essentially the same as you would discount a, a, a B rated corporate bond. Um, you know, given it's a franchisee, we don't we don't know exactly what his his credit his uh, financials are, but you know, I wouldn't expect it to be a much lower discount rate than that. And then I would use the same discount rate for the disposition cash flows. Um, I don't think those need to be discounted more than the income cash flows, which is normally what you would do. But, you know, in this case, like I said, I think that the real estate's really good. Um, so if you were to use a nine discount rate for both of those, you end up at a 7.27 cap. So, you know, that range, that like seven, low sevens range um, is probably the price, you know, I'd, I'd like to see if I was, if I was going to purchase this property, um, you know, someone might be interested in that six cap, you know, there's a buyer for every, for every deal, but um a fair value in fair intrinsic value um i would believe would be in that seven low sevens range yeah you know for me i think great market i think the market's got a long-term uh um great long-term view um i think the concept is really good i think child care is only going to continue to 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 be a need um it looked like that was a market where their ramp up, I think they were at full capacity within a month, which is very, very good in um, mm -hmm. child care. So, you know, and then, and then you've got, <clears throat> you know, I don't, I cannot speak to, to the guarantor, right? That's the, that's the big, it's the big question, but assuming that they're good um, or, or, you know, at least relatively strong and a good operator. Uh, and it sounds like they are, they picked a, a market and a location that ramp up was for, for just a month. Right. So I, I would, um, I would want to see this trade in that seven cap range. 
Uh, I'm sure whatever brokers watching us talk about this and this is their listing. It's like, no, absolutely not. But listen, this isn't six months ago. This isn't 12 months ago. Um, I get it. But you're going to have to start seeing these things rise um, eventually. And I think now is a good time for that. I really do. Um, so I think we're my people are probably a buyer in that seven to seven and a quarter range pending the guarantor financials. That's what I'm calling yep. Tyler. 100 per one, three, four, eight is the closing cap rate. We should be able to bet on closing cap rates. Same way you can bet on sports, you know, pick the yeah. other over. Hey, you might should, be honest. Someone should come up with a site like that. Cap rate, closing cap rate betting. I'd, I'd, I'd do yeah. that. I'd, I'd, I'd have a great time doing that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, just to cap anyway. rate course. Anyway, hey, thanks for another week, Tyler. Um, if anyone's interested, let us know. Um, we would love to discuss, you know, whether this works for you or if something else works. Um, we're happy to discuss that and find something that works best for you. All right. All right. See you, Winston. Nice See ya. Cheers. Bye, everybody.